Well, good evening, everybody. I'm David Spadafora, president of the Newberry Library, and I want to welcome all of you and thank you for joining us for the second in our new series of conversations at the Newberry. The Newberry has been offering educational programs to the public since the early 1890s. So we think of this new series as an integral part of a long and important tradition in Chicago. Tonight's program is being audio recorded by Chicago Amplified, which is an initiative of Chicago Public Radio. Chicago Amplified is a web-based audio library of educational events, and you can listen to a podcast of this event at the Chicago Amplified website, wbez.org slash amplified. Book TV is also recording the program, and we will post on our website the broadcast time when it is known. Toward the end of the program this evening, there will be an opportunity for audience involvement. In order to make sure that everybody can hear audience comments or questions, and to include what you have to say in the recording, we will bring a microphone to audience members who want to speak. With uh, other forms of technology in mind, then let me ask you now to be sure that your cell phones and other devices are turned off or silenced. I want to thank our sponsors, Newberry Trustee Sue Gray and her husband Mel for generally, generously supporting these events. As the longtime co-chair of one of our book groups, Sue appreciates fully the importance of conversation about ideas, and she's played an important part in creating this series and in thinking about the kinds of conversations and conversationalists that we should host here. So, Sue, thanks very much. Our conversationalists tonight are extremely well-known members of the Chicago and indeed the national intellectual, cultural, and legal worlds. My introductions of them will be brief since I feel confident that all of you know something of them and their work. Scott Turow has had a fascinating career, mixing work as a prominent lawyer at the firm SNR Denton, as it is known today, with writing and especially the writing of fiction. His novels have won much acclaim from reviewers and from his peers, symbolized by their receipt of prestigious honors, including a British Silver Dagger Award. Moreover, they have reached an enormous audience. Millions of copies of them have sold. Mr. Thoreau's pro bono contributions to the legal environment of the state of Illinois, among other places, are notable, including his involvement with the Hernandez case and with the reexamination of the death penalty here. He is currently serving his second term as president of the Authors Guild. Most of you probably know about it, but in case you don't, it's an American organization that supports and provides a range of pro bono advice to authors and has taken strong stands on such matters as the Google Books project. I have to say that one of the things I like most about Scott is that he is an ardent and knowledgeable baseball fan. Another is that he's a longtime friend of the Newberry. And I want to add that if you haven't yet read his 1977 book, 1L, I urge you to do so. As Chicago Magazine has recently reminded us, Fred Shapiro of the Yale Law School believes that Richard Posner is the most cited jurist of the 20th century, and I presume now 21st century. There's good reason to come to this conclusion First, he's been a member of the Seventh Circuit, Court, uh, Seventh Circuit of the United States Court of Appeals since 1981 and has written a vast body of legal opinion. Second, during that time he's published many, many books and articles and in recent years he's become a much discussed blogger. Third, taken as a group, his publications explore what I think is a remarkable range of intellectual interests, doing so with great subtlety. And fourth, he's helped to educate and train a large number of students at the University of Chicago Law School, where he's remained on the faculty since becoming a judge. 
among what I think are his most interesting books is his study of the decline of public intellectuals and, I might add, the absorbing introduction he wrote for a new edition of a largely forgotten classic, James Fitzjames Stevens' Liberty, Equality, and Fraternity. It is a, a good introduction, uh, I believe, to Judge Posner's approach to thinking about big issues that are legal, but more than legal. This evening, Mr. Thoreau and Judge Posner are going to talk about books, authors, libraries, and their fates in the digital age. Obviously, the issues involved are important to us here at the Newberry, and we think they should be important to everyone. Let me provide a little context for the discussion that is going to ensue by quoting two recent seemingly contrasting comments by people who have connections with the Newberry. One comes from Robert H. Jackson, a trustee of ours and a noted Cleveland collector, who introduced with these words an important conference on books in hard times at this country's most important bibliophilic society, the Grolier Club of New York. Today, books face the four horsemen of the print media apocalypse, computer, video, the internet, and the iPhone. History is changing books, and it's something for us to worry about." Unquote. Then there is what Princeton's Anthony Grafton, recipient of the Newbery Award, wrote in his wonderful little book, Codex in Crisis. Sit in your local coffee shop, and your laptop can tell you a lot, especially if you wield your search terms adeptly. But if you want deeper, more local knowledge, you will still have to take the narrower path through the library doors and into the land of physical reading material. Gentlemen, we are grateful to both of you for being here this evening, and we look forward to your conversation. Well, I, I promised that David that I would start, um, and uh, this will be basically sort of a, a, a few minutes of wool gathering uh, on, on my part. Um, as David mentioned, I am the president of the Authors Guild, uh, and uh, I did it the first time in the early 1990s, uh, and the difference now um, is remarkable. Uh, I spent uh, the yesterday afternoon and this morning in Washington making stops as president of the Authors Guild uh, in, the, in various uh, Senate and House chambers, talking with intellectual property staff, and finally this morning a large meeting um, at the Justice Department uh, talking about uh, antitrust issues affecting uh, the book industry all of them uh, relating to the digital uh, revolution. And um, just to throw out some of the, of the many problems, um, the electronic book, um, which probably <clears throat> does not uh, encounter universal favor uh, in this audience, um, but you know the ebook, I think, is unquestionably here to stay, <clears throat> and it's here to stay uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is portability. Um, those of us who spend a lot of time on airplanes know uh, that it's a lot easier to have the iPad that I use to write on now um, than, than than to be carrying you know three bulkier books with me. It's also here to stay because I think publishers have uh, begun to realize that it dramatically reduces their cost structure. They don't, uh, you know, publishing is often referred to as a 19th century business dragged kicking and screaming into the 20th century a hundred years too late. And uh, they initially were indisposed to the ebook, uh, and uh, now they've realized they don't have printing costs. They don't have warehousing costs. They don't have shipping costs. And 
uh, most gloriously. Uh, the book, the book.